This is a recording of the September 25th, 2022 hybrid event held at the South Bay Historical Railroad Society. This is Dave Adams talking about his scratch building project to build the Chama Depot for his SN3 layout. Thank you, Phil. I'm glad to be here. Uh, this clinic actually is recycled uh, as a it's a build of about uh, 2009, and I looked at it and I thought, okay, this has got a lot of brute force methods in here. So for everybody that's not into 3D printing, there may be something in here that's going to be useful to you. Uh, the way I've got this organized. When I start a project, as you establish what are your objectives, what are your limits, you've got to research what you're going to build, build mockups, see how it's going to fit in your layout, what materials you can use, you can break them all down so you can make progress and not be overwhelmed by the whole thing. And then we're going to talk about how that applies to the specific building that I built using this, and that's the Chama Depot. And the other thing that you're going to find is creeping elegance. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and whether it's okay or fun and, and how to call it quits. And then finally, the result. So this is an example of objectives and limits. And I, and I sit down and I write these. I've got a notebook. I put all of this stuff in. Uh, for the Chama Depot, I didn't want to have to compress it. It had to have the same level or higher of the... Uh, craftsmanship and the rest of everything on the layout, just simply so the layout kind of blends together. Uh, it was going to be 1930s era with the major features. It was going to be in a mud and brown paint scheme. Um, Got to be a credible model to those folks that know what the prototype is. So th these are all the things that I wanted to do. The other thing that was really important, because we do a lot of operating, um, it had to be a location that visiting operators could recognize as the place to stop the passenger train. So without that, as people were stopping all over the Chama yard. So this is this has kind of solved that problem. Um, not a contest model because I had to truncate the back of it to fit in the space. I did not plan on an interior other than maybe the operator's bay window. And the other decision I made is if I didn't have the information, make something up and plow it in. That's the goal is to keep making progress on the, on the model. Proposal. It's tiny to where you're never going to find the last piece of data you need. And then the other thing that I wanted to do is have it done by Oscale West in 2009. And I wanted to maintain monthly off sessions on the railroad while this building was in process. So the uh, part of the deal is, is what's going to be built? And so I basically put together binders. I've got an entire workbook with everything I know about Chama and things that collected all over uh, for stuff that was too big for the notebook, hanging files and a file cabinet worked fine. Uh, and it's just a just a matter of organizing this stuff so you, you can find it. The other thing is, is collect all the publish, published plans you can find. And so I was fortunate I was able to find plans out of the MNRA Bulletin in uh, 1973. Mike Blazik offered drawings of the depot. John Maxwell had tracings of the original Rio Grande drawings. And then Sandia Software at one time offered a CD with scale plans on it. You could rescale and print out. So that uh, that turned out to be a real aid. So even though you have all that information, you still need to know what did this thing really look like? And this is where your field research comes in. Unfortunately, the building still exists. There's lots been published on the end of a real grand narrow gauge. And so you start collecting all the photos you can find at the depot of various ages and things. And you start studying those, not because you're interested in the trains, it's because you're interested in, in what the photos show you about that building. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, any, anytime you can get out in the field to look at trains is a good thing. So you're always going to want to take advantage of that. So that ends up with a whole bunch of notes as far as uh, photos, what's in them, et cetera. On that. Again, this is part of getting ready to build. And if the thing exists, cool thing is to go visit it and try and find the areas that haven't been restored by somebody that uh, didn't what they did. So in this case, uh, I was able to get all the dimensions of the windows because they're still original. And I discovered it was a board and back building that shows up on the plan. You can see it in the photos. But what I didn't realize until I was up really looking at it, this is a bath. 
It's got an OG profile. So they actually milled all that stuff. It just does, was not one by two or one by three nailed up there. I mean, it had this definite profile to it. And that was neat because you can see that in the shadow. So that was going to be a challenge. The other thing was, was the, uh, the shingles on the, on the gable ends of the building. Um, how, let's see. Bill's making some adjustments here. Oh, Okay, and you can see that on, on, on either end. Thank you, Phil. Um, so the other thing is mock-ups. Uh, these, are, these are really important, particularly if you're building a railroad. You got to know, you know, is it going to look right in the scene? How's it going to fit? And you can make adjustments from there. So in this case, it was a matter of foam bar, printing out the CDS software plans, a quarter inch scale, gluing on foam bar, cutting it out, and uh, away we go. We had a mock-up. That basically um, stood in there for 17 years until I got the real the real building built. So uh, the other thing that's important about mock-ups is they are all throwaways. The China Depot was a throwaway, but this thing was a mock-up for the one of the warehouses that stood there that uh, still exists. That's used by the friends as part of their carpentry uh, carpentry shop. Uh, in this case, it stood in the just plain old artist illustration board and. Uh, uh, braced with a whole lot of home cut uh, quarter inch strips. And eventually, I got around to basically applying uh, uh, coordinated siding to it, windows weathered it, and all of a sudden we went from a mock up to a, to a model. Just took a while to get there. So, the other thing that you're doing when you're going to scratch build is you've got to pick what kind of materials do I want to work with. So I'm just going to run through some of the things that are commonly used by modelers. Plaster is one of them. It's absolutely great for stonework and brickwork. I've done both of them, hand carving this stuff. It forms out of styrene or wood for the wall pores. You can carve it, and carve it with granite picks. And the other thing is, is it, is it carves really fast. If you take a 32,000 diameter piano wire and you grind the tip so it looks like a D, put that in your moto tool, you can basically cut, cut channels and, and make, make rocks like nobody's business. That is a really fast way to get this done. Uh, yeah, it, it turns out, you know, by planting my hands, you know, I, I have a little palm rest that I put my hands on to steady them because I'm not getting any steadier as I get older. And so with that, I was able to get enough control to basically do a credible job of the stone in this particular powerhouse. Uh, the other thing, plaster, this is more plaster, is your bridge abutments. Every, you know, you don't need to buy chute, you can, but nobody made any abutments like the ones I needed. And I had access to the prototype drawings at Colorado Railroad Museum for the Navajo Bridge. And so this is a multi-part styrene form that was put together with uh, 256 screws and everything else. And then I was able to pour the two abutments I needed for either end of the bridge. Using this form and that built into the form are all of the all of the uh, form lines and everything else like that. So it came out to be pretty easy to model there. Looking at another material, wood. Well, it's advantage. Wood looks like wood. I mean, that's the beauty of it. There's a wide variety of scale dimensional strip wood and milled stocks available. It's easy to distress. It works with a lot of different adhesives. You can paint it or stain it. Oh, it's kind of clever. If you're in larger scales or even the smaller ones, you can cut your own stuff. You want this one, two, two, eight, you want, right? Two, two, eight. You want that one, right? I've got a small, oh, what used to be, I guess, a micro mark. Two, two, eight. I used to cut a lot of strip wood. The really fine stuff I get from Mount Elder. But this this structure right here, that's a um, that's a wood structure as opposed to uh, styrene or something else. Again, the handy about wood is, is it looks like wood when it's stained. So here we got some again, these are all scratch built. Those loads, that's fresh cut lumber here in a gondola car headed off of the RGS for a creosoting plant in Alamosa. Uh, last material, and this is one of my favorite to work with, and that's styrene. I mean, it's really versatile. You can get it to look like wood, you can make it look like metal, it can look like brick and concrete. It's easy to work with. It's got you get to use quick bonding solvents, so I mean your your progress of building or assembling something can really go really go quickly. It's strong, it's flexible. The downside is it's really hard on tools. I mean it's hard on knife edges, etc. So you're going to go through a lot of those working board. 
Yeah. So this structure up here in the Corona is a section house and that's, uh, that's all started in construction. Okay, so I talked about the task breakdown. And the way I usually look at this is you look at a building and you say, okay, it's a it's a rectangle or no, it's a rectangle with, with extensions on it. What, what you're really looking at is a collection of blocks. You're thinking about how you want to break this down and, and, and approach it. So what set of boxes make up a big, you know, outline or footprint? Some of them have doors and window openers. Okay, so you can do that. Exterior sides, uh, they can be decorated with something, you know, purchased or you're going to fabricate what you're going to decorate the, the, the sides with. And then subassembly and, and parts. As many projects basically help provide focus, keep the thing going and, and progress. And the other thing is, is if you work in sub-assemblies, it's gonna make painting of the structure a whole lot easier. So the question is, does it matter where you start? In this case, this is uh, this was a depot. It's patterned after one that used to be on the, on the uh, Santa Fe branch. And it simply was a box car, you know, up on cribbing with, uh, a freight platform built on one side and steps down the other side. And this was just basically put together in styrene. I think I, that went together in an evening and I think I spent the next day next day painting it. So uh, there isn't anything special about that. But again, it's it's the box theory and you do what's what's going to be visible and kind of move on. So another another part of this large project is and I'm in the round of the Dinko is I actually started building chimneys. There was no commercial castings available that even came close. And so after looking at this, I said, you know, I really want these chimneys to be pretty much right. So this is this is what we've got. Uh, you got the mock-up, so you know what the depot is going to look like. The final assembly is going to go faster if you build all the parts for it first, as opposed to building the structure and then, you know, sweating over all the parts. The other, other cool part is, is you're building the main thing is you can adjust that to fit the parts you made. So you know they're going to fit versus trying to, trying to build build parts to fit something that you already may have cut in a, in, in a window there. And then the other thing is, is when you're doing this, you're making progress, and they don't take up much room in storage to get it done, unlike a, unlike a large structure. Okay, so the, the Chuma Depot project in quarter inch scale is I decided the Maxwell plans were a good match to the few 1930s published photos that, that I could find. Um, and there was nothing on the market that matched the doors, the windows, the chimneys, et cetera. So those were all going to have to be parts that was going to build. Um, the depot baths were a milled OG shape. There wasn't anything on the market. Um, nothing able to match the decorative wood shingles on the siding of the gables. And published photos in the 30s, here's where I took modeler's license. It didn't have the resolution to tell me what the roofing material was. I mean, it was just plain dark up there. It could have been shingles. It could have been tar paper. It could have been anything. So I like wood shingles. So I made a decision that we're going to do wood, wooden shingles. Because I'm pretty sure that when this thing was originally rebuilt after the fire in 1891, that they would have used wood shingles at that time on the structure. So the, um, the other thing is the space I had for it on the layout said I was going to have to truncate it. So some basic decisions. We were going to use styrene for the structure and the painted wood parts. We were going to use wood for unpainted wood. Um, would I be able to get laser cut window sash to my specification? I had all the prototype dimensions. I'd done one inch scale drawings of this. And so all I needed to do was find somebody that was willing to uh, run their laser and cut stuff for me out of a laser board for the sash. I really didn't relish the thought of trying to, trying to do all that. But that came to back to bite me later. Um, so the other thing is I wanted to build it to allow access to the waiting room and the, uh, the agent's operator's office and the crew the uh, crew desk in there just simply because those are railroad kinds of details and kind of neat. I wasn't going to do the inside of the freight shed or the, or the living quarters. So we started with the windows. The windows are designed to need field notes. Drawings are made so we could cut, have that cut from laser board, 64th inch plywood. And I did find somebody that would do that for me. So that, that really, really helped a lot. And in the, the frames for the sash were made out of styrene. And here's what those look like. So I'm, I'm a great fan of using styrene to build fixtures and jigs and this sort that is an aid to assembling models. And so what you've got here is we had depot living, and living windows, we had the big front window, we had side windows, we had some small windows scattered down the building and up at the ends. 
And so I just made these fixtures. And what this allowed me to do here was, was cut strips diary, put it in here. The holes in the corners are drilled out. That's so I don't bond, <laughs> bond the strips diary I'm using as a frame to my, my uh, jig here. So, you know, if you had a little overrun of adhesive, it didn't make any difference. So here's what, here's what comes out of, out of a jig like that. There's a staggering frame. Uh, here's the laser cut uh, window sash there. And here's the two of them assembled. And that was, uh, th this is just something I do a lot. It just makes things a whole lot easier in trying to hold things together and uh, build them while you're going there. Uh, again, on the doors, the doors were, were similar. Um, uh, I had field notes and dimensions and everything again photographs of it. So this was just a matter of sitting down with uh, white styrene and, um, and building these things. The two freight doors, I decided, yeah, those are going to be closed. I didn't want because I wasn't going to do interiors in either the, uh, the railway express baggage baggage room or in the in the freight dock. The the man man doors in it, I made those so the so the door and the, and the frame were separate. That way I could position them. Um, um, so this kind of gets back to the chimney thing. So part of the chimney was getting the dimensions and then we had a pile of bricks out in the backyard. So I went out and basically said, let me mock up the clues and see what this thing is going to look like. Because from the drawings, you could see that, that these, these were double flue uh, chimneys because you had a stove over here and the waiting room, you had another stove over in the, uh, in the agent operator's office. Then you had another stove in the living quarters on that, and then a heater in another room there. So we have a total of four stoves in the building and two chimneys. So it was going to be a double, double chimney. So this just mocked up, and then I basically did some sketches of how I was going to do it. This, this is the brick here. So this was all measured up and cut into strips that were one brick high. And then again, these strips were sliced off, and they were just slid using the L. Armitage technique of building up bricks row by row. And so this is what you what you ended up with. Uh, for the core, I used 40,000 scribe styrene. And the reason for that was that gave me a nice horizontal line around the thing to get my brick strips lined up so they would stay pretty, pretty square to the thing. So that's the uh, result of the uh, chimney. Was it tedious? The answer is yeah, but it got me what I wanted, which was uh, some reasonably prototype chimneys there. Okay, uh, now on to making more parts. And this was the uh, thing that took me a while to figure it out. And that was the decorative gable end, end shingles. And uh, measuring them, I said, okay, I, I can sit down and I can use a Northwest short line chopper and I can chop up a whole lot of little shingles here. Now what I'm going to do is figure out how to hold them together at the right spacing on that so I can basically layer these up on the strips. The thought of trying to put each individual shingle up there individually was going to be way more tedious than I wanted to do. So um, turns out that the general scale rule that you can get it down at a hobby shop is I just basically tape that down to the front right at the top of my workbench on that. And it turns out the thickness of that was just right. I could butt up a piece of a 10, of a 10 thousandths strip to use to hold the shingles together. And I could slide the shingles up there and then use the uh, gradations on there to space them. And so that's what I did. And then these were all glued together. Of course, you've got your solvent running under it and everything else. So you let that dry overnight. And then you pulled up the tape. They got a single edge razor blade. And you just run it into the strip and popped right up on the mic. So, you know, I spent several evenings <laughs> making, making those kinds of things. Um, and then the, uh, for the, the OG is what did I do there? Well, this was, the model was nominally viewed from about three feet. So I didn't have to be dead on it. The thought of trying to grind a cutter, you know, to mill my own seemed to be way beyond my 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 leg, so I didn't. What I what I did is I, I fooled around with just uh, some stock evergreen strips I read, and I, I simulated it. So what my bats actually are is a, is a base with a top sitting on the top of it, two two pieces of ten thousand six diary. And interestingly enough, from three feet is you don't know that it's not a cut OG. It looks pretty good because it's got the shadow detail effect, which is, you know, one of the things that, uh, that was important on the model. And then the other other thing, at this point, you had a bunch of parts, and so you're ready to go. And you figure out the rest of the building. Well, these are all my notes and things from building, essentially, a, uh, contractors and people basically build a, a ledger pole that they use to determine the tops of doors, window, bay sites, window top rates, and everything else during construction. So this essentially was my, uh, my ledger for the depot. 
So it basically went from uh, mile height on up to the uh, on up to the uh, tallest item on the, on the building. So I knew where the base of all my windows was was going to be around the building. I knew where the doors were going to be, the pop lights, etc. And this was uh, referred to a lot. And even then, I still got it wrong, and we had to make a correction uh, later later on. I decided that uh, that I was going to make the base of this thing out of forty thousand styrene, and then uh, forty thousand styrene when it well, it's flexible, way too flexible. So I thought I got to solve this problem. So in, the, in this case, this again is more strip styrene. It's glued down in here for the freight platforms that went went around it, the platform uh, uh, the door level around the passenger end of it, <clears throat> and. What I was worried about was getting a decent bond between the wood on the platform and this styrene substructure. So I thought, well, I really didn't want to use AC because if I tried gluing the wood strips on the AC, I was going to make a mess up. I'm just not that not that skilled to be able to do that without getting glue all over the place. So what I did is I took more wood that was going to be hidden, in, and that was going to be the gluing base for the uh, for the planks. And so that is just put on there with AC like crazy mad. When I had that done, is my base all of a sudden became very rigid. And it got even more rigid when I started using your usual carpenter or white glue, which you basically put on the rest of the plank. So what we ended up with is a base that looks like what you see on the right. And you can kind of see the, the structure as it is up, up there with interior partitions. So the wall and trim construction, what I, I hate masking. I, I built a depot where I had the Wazo that was uh, by PBL, it was a Jefferson depot. And it had all kinds of gingerbread and, and it decided this looked enough like a New York Central Station that that would do it. So they made me an offer I couldn't refuse and I said yes and uh, built that. I spent days masking that thing because it's a two-tone paint and they had all of this little filigree and everything to go around. I just thought, I didn't want to do that on this model, so I'm not going to solve that problem. Well, I saw killed two birds with one stone, and that is, is this a styrene and it bonds really well? I don't think you can do that. If I took all of the all of the wood trim and everything else, and I made that out of two pieces, each piece the half thickness, what this would do, this would give me a bonding thing that I could basically paint the trim independent of this thing, cut it. Glue it over the, the base piece that was already on there. You know, the fact that it was painted the, the base color of the depot didn't make any difference at that point. People weren't going to see that. And so I did that. The other thing it did that was really good is it provided a ledger for working the mats up against. So I had a good, nice, big fit. So this is, this is the case here. You know, on, on this guy, you can see uh, up at the top, there's a uh, Half of the subtrim bands that are applied, you can see I'm starting to put the bands up, up there. I can put them up against that half piece. And by the time I got the uh, got this building painted and I put on the painted trim pieces, it, they were, it just it really worked well. So this was a labor and time saving effort there. Then the other thing is you just you just kind of keep working at it and uh, you, you keep putting together test assemblies and see how it's going to fit, how's it going to fit in the basement, whatever, in the base, how do I need to make adjustments? And the other thing is, is that, uh, yeah, if you're going to solve a problem, it's going to be now while well, everything is in a flat stage. If you've got to take a train cut somewhere, it's a lot easier with it being flat <laughs> on your workbench than it is trying to hold something that's already been glued together and take a, take a train cut. Um, the interior details, I, I left myself open to be able to detail the interior. And so I thought, okay, I need in the office and in the waiting room is I've got to get the beam board and everything up on the wall. So that was all laminated on the inside. Um, a friend of mine uh, who since passed, was, he would come over every Sunday afternoon for dinner and we would do his lunch while he was an XSP employee and just a really, really nice guy. And so he would sit there and he'd say, let's go out and work on a model day. So he'd sit there and watch. And then he'd say, you're going to do an interior, aren't you, for the for the agent's office at least, you know, how about the waiting room? So this is where the creeping elegance came in. As I had this good friend of mine sitting next to me who kept saying, don't quit now, keep going, you know. So that, that uh, and, and I'm glad he did actually, it worked out, it worked out pretty well. So 
the, the trick was is I had left the back of this building open. That way I could slide in boxes in the various rooms. And so what you're looking at here, the exterior walls are all grown up. You can see the roof has been uh, uh, framed and braced here. Again, that was fiery. And at the upper right hand corner, you can see a, a, a roof over there. Well, that basically covers the, uh, the waiting room and the agent's, uh, agent's office uh, on that. And you can see wire running around because if you're going to do an interior, you've got to get, get lights up there. Okay, so, so fitting the roof, um, I drew out where I wanted to have my, my formers in there to keep everything nice and, nice and square. And then because this is truncated and it was at an angle, is those inside formers were not all the same length. So then I had to uh, figure out how, how to do that. Well, I could measure that by basically measuring from this base that fit in exactly against the backdrop back there. And it told me what length as I worked on the building that I had to truncate the a roof warmer. So that, that's what you have there. The other thing that shows on here is I needed roof trim and I didn't know what the dimensions were. And so this was a case of just taking your error and styrene and using various sizes and doing a bunch of test builds and then choosing the one that looked closest to what you saw in the photographs. I mean, there wasn't any precision or anything in that. It was just, okay, this, this, this looks like it's going to do it. And then you can go from there. So, you know, trial and error works in this stuff. Didn't take much time because again, it was Staring, the bonding went really quick. So here we got the trim glued around the visible edges of the roof. Uh, we got the braces in there. Um, and uh, the roof section over the bay window is that was cut out after I put the roof line in place. And I very carefully traced where I had to cut into the roof to get the, uh, get the, get the bay to work on, on that. So again, this was test fit, test fit, cut. So, you know, guys that do kits do, do us all a big favor because they do all of us hard work for us. The scratch building is you're going you're gonna to be doing a lot of fooling around to get things to, things to go right. And so this is a, just another picture here. You can see we've got the, the, the roof over the operators being out there. You can see where the roof has been cut back to fit over here. You can see we've made some other trim fits there. And then, yeah, the wiring for the, for the uh, lights. Here's how it all fits together. Strangely enough, putting this, this the, the roof on a getting down there is you, you pry the, uh, the operator's bay roof upward, and it's basically a snap fit back into the building. And here I basically had to cut through some trim cases and get a little flush fit on the back, back side. Um, so, then we have, let's take the whole thing over, drop it in the place on the land where it's supposed to go. And the first thing I discovered is nuts. The whole, the whole structure is sitting too high. So, somewhere I blew it in my my, my ledger pole. Good news was is my yard is, is home so so that, then we got out the old utility knife and so basically cut away all the home so down to the down to the suburb there you know, which is a sheet of plywood and then I basically was able to shim up the the, uh, the base of the building up to the height that got me the height I needed for for right right track work. So you you always got some do overs and other start overs. So the, the part of the creeping elegance here is uh, we did the office and waiting room now interior. I was going to have to do a couple of things. One, there were windows on the back side of this. And you can see through the depot, out those back windows and an embankment that was behind the depot. Well, I didn't cut out the windows, but I did when I was building this insert. This insert just slides in. So this wall and this wall are bonded to the, to the structure itself, but everything else is Slid into place. So with these, this is, I really didn't want to cut out the door. So this is a grant line door that would work. And I just used sandpaper and I sanded that down to about half the thickness, glued it in there, put a frame around it. So that was another way to solve that problem. Otherwise, the uh, train lens counter was, uh, was built in place out of styrene with door fronts and door fronts and all the other kinds of things on it. And I still had to uh, do something about the windows. The I was miserly when I had the laser cut sash done. I only ordered the exact number I needed. I should have gone for an exact number plus five, just you know, for wastage and unexpected things. So the, all of the double hung sash back here is I had to scratch build that. So my labor saving of having the windows uh, almost worked, but not quite because I was too cheap to spend the money for a few extra cuts. Um, the lighting. This is back in the days before. 
I understood LEDs. And so for interiors, you could use green and wheat. So for green and wheat bulbs, this is just brass tubing soldered to brass strip. And then half the tubing is filed away with a bulb up there. This does a couple of things. One, it heat sinks the green and wheat bulb. So you aren't melting it through your plastic. And then two, it kind of gave me a reflector and a little bit more of the gold glow, which is common of uh, uh, illumination of that, that, that area. And um, so this, as you can see, I've got in position here. This strip was there. I just put in with, uh, a little bit of uh, scale bumps and things of this sort. And then the wire runs down. I've got a tube here that extends down to the way out. So when I put the thing in place and the wire in there, it goes down. So I can make that, make the electrical connections. Um, same thing on the top is just homemade file PC board strips for soldering all of the all of the wires on. Here's the one for the lake that goes out over the operator's bay. Here you can see the files notches here for the tubing to, to uh, nestle down in the in the lake from out there. And on the back, because you can see through there, and I've gotten all the work building all these windows. If I just put it up against the backdrop, it's going to be dark. So I thought, okay, what I need to do is I need to get light behind this building. <laughs> so, you know, if somebody's down and squinting through there, they can see what looks like scenery or something out that back window. So these were, were essentially, again, it's, it's more green and wheat bulbs, more brass tubes with a slip file in it, put in there, and then that tube was soldered to a piece of damp brass. I really didn't know how this was going to work, so I made a, a, a strip or a hole here. It would allow me to make some adjustments as far as how far away from the window was this going to be. So this in a sense just work just like an art picture or a washer kind of a kind of fixture on that. And yeah, here's here's what the effect was. So now on the you know, down there as the lights are on, you're looking through there, and you got the back wall washer is going down. Some green rear of entry scenery back there, but it looks like you can see through the belt, which which you have to do. So that, that basically that was the you know, that real um, exterior coloring. Again, we decided this is we use shoe dyes, thing with alcohol for the stains for the wood parts. Um, the everything that was styrene got painted primer gray before any any of the top colors were on there. And that was just done with it. A, a rattle can, a spray can, things like the little tomato primer would be super for that. They just pulled out, you don't even know they're there. Um, so then, then we ended up, well, this is back in the days of poly scale paint. So the Floco used to make a color, which is about dead on for this building. Well, that dropped from their line. So now it was a matter of me irritating my wife and mixing up all kinds of paint samples, painting and letting them dry and asking my wife. Because I'm, I'm somewhat colorblind, so I really can't see what I'm doing. So at one point, she finally said, this is close enough, give it up. I'm not checking any more dang paint mixes. So we said, that's it. We're, we're, we're stopping right here. We're going to paint. And so that's what we did. Um, and then we had masking here for under the eaves and things of this sort. And we painted all of the doors, window frames, and everything else, and those trim uh, as, as well before all those were assembled. And the, the chimney was painted the, the body color of the depot, and it was just crushed and it was going to go around. The interior, the non visible areas, they were just sprayed with flat black. Because so I really didn't want any light leaks or any, any appearances, this, you know, the non visible parts being translucent, which on a staggering structure they sometimes appear to be. Um, the office and waiting room walls, I brush painted these. Because you really weren't going to be able to get down there and look at them. And it's a whole lot easier to clean a brush than it is break out your airbrush, get that set up, spend two minutes spraying, and then spend another half hour cleaning it up. So we can see time here. And the office and waiting room floors, you'll see the floor, big mistake. I had basically covered those with a uh, base color of acrylic, and I should have run tests and determined how would an alcohol wash go over with this. You will see not really well. But the good news is, in a finished model, you really can't see it. The net result of this is, is we finally got the tempo in place after 17 years of the markup. So we were able to uh, bust that down, salvage the uh, strip wood out of it for use of bracing and some other structure. Okay, here's the here's the uh, front of the depot from end to end. It's, it's uh, scale length. The darn thing is uh, close to three feet long. 
Uh, here you can see where it's truncated on this end uh, to fit up against the backdrop. I, showed, I purposely made the platform narrower because I thought it was more important to get the peak of the roof headed downhill on the back side of the building than it was to have a scale width platform there. And so that actually worked out, uh, worked out pretty well. Uh, the other end here, and this is the same thing, this is you know, not much going on in this thing. But this is where the photographs of the prototype come in, and a couple of neat things. If you take a look at the grid end there, you see one of a couple of things that look like little buckets and a fire, fire barrel. Well, those two things hanging out there are fire buckets. Fire buckets have round bottoms, so those are just fabricated out of some green, painted red, and hung out there. And you say, why a round bottom? Well, because Nobody's going to steal a bucket that doesn't sit square when you put it down. It would fall over. So fire buckets generally had the round bottom in it to discourage people from stealing them. So that, that seemed to work out. To work out, and that was uh, again something that a friend of mine had actually a prototype, and also knew what the story was. This is the same gentleman that had me on to do the interior. Um, so the other things out here are typical. The photographs show they had a Fairbanks Morse scale on the platform. Typically, it was a hand truck. And they usually had a plate here that put between the platform and the box car when they're moving stuff, stuff in and out. OK, this uh, same thing here. This uh, box up on top is, well, that's all the lightning protection and everything else before the uh, leads came down into the end of the depot and into the operator's bay there. It's, that was prominent in the number of photographs. And the so I said, I don't know what was in there, but I can certainly do a credible job of modeling the exterior and putting it up on the top of that communication statement. So it's those kinds of things that are fun to do. Again, here's a picture of what it looks like we've got part of the interior in there. And here where you can see the experiment with polyscale floor with a alcohol sea dye wash didn't work. And like I said, fortunately, the viewing angles are such that with people in place, you really can't see that. Um, this right here, the little cab with a hole in it, that's actually threaded. Uh, there's a screw in there that basically holds down the roof in place. So it doesn't, it's got the lighting and everything. But otherwise, uh, you've got the operator bay here. You've got the, there's the train crew. Lobby, if you will, that's a train register sitting on the desk. It was <laughs> going up. Here's the here's the desk there, stove in the middle and heated. And then you started looking at what did typical country stations have for interior furnishings? Well, they all had a safe, they had a whole top desk, they had their communication stuff. And this is straight out of photos from China. You have a board up here, they had a repeater up there, you've got a um a high standing uh, telegraph sounder here with probably with a so all the only can jammed in there is an amplifier. Uh, down here, you've got your telegraph key. You've got that time forms are coming in the, in the place. You've got a wall phone out there for communicating with the, with the outside world. And then here's the other things, your roll top big desk, the garbage cans, and things of this sort. And you've got the uh, agent operator over here talking to the train crew. So, guy standing in the waiting room trying to buy a ticket. So the usual friend of the railroad service. And so this is kind of getting to the end. This is a night view of the, of the build. And uh, that's it. I'll be happy to try and answer any questions. And the other thing is after looking at the stuff that's over there, or for the contests that people brought in, is these guys should have given this clinic rather than me. I mean, that, that stuff was just brought in. But at any rate, if you're interested, um, layouts open this afternoon. You can see that. And then uh, my COVID project, which is the China Roundhouse which yeah, finished earlier this year. So any, any questions? Seems to, uh, seems to work. 
Yeah, I, I have had the same experience where I've made a lot of my speeches before and I said, now I've got to do something different. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. For, for, yeah, okay. It's yeah. not a question, it's more of a comment. You are very qualified to give this presentation. Well, no we, matter what uh, you yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, John.